my name is Mike Cunningham. I'm uh, part of the Armouth County Historical Society, and this presentation is about the building of the Armouth Bar. Now, not so much the people of the Armouth Bar or the businesses, but the actual physical building of the Armouth Bar. This, this presentation is dedicated in memory of my uncle Albert, who passed away just January the 6th, 2022, at the age of 89 years old. Uncle Albert and I were, were quite close. And Uncle Albert was a hardcore Yarmouth Bar fisherman. So the presentation tonight is all about the Yarmouth Bar and how important the Yarmouth Bar is to Yarmouth's history. And we drive over that bar, we go to the lighthouse to visit and all that stuff. But a lot of people don't appreciate just how significant and what a change it made in Yarmouth's history of building this bar. Why did Yarmouth grow the way it did? Well, uh, at first, I mean, we, we didn't have a beautiful harbor. As a matter of fact, the early explorers described it as a narrow crooked channel with extensive mud flats. But despite that, we became the second uh, largest port in all of Canada for registered shipping tonnage in 1878-1879. And the reason was mainly our location, because we were the, the most suitable harbor on the southwestern part of Nova Scotia for ships to find shelter and stuff like that. We were close to some really good uh, uh, fishing grounds. And then of course, uh, early on, a lot of what, what we were doing was, was trading with New England. And, and a lot of this is because of the Armand Bar. Now, I've got one picture here and I've put, note the old breakwater location. This is from 1951. This is an aerial view showing the brand new concrete breakwater, the one that we currently have and the, the old breakwater location. Notice how it had quite a curve to it. Now, I just want you to keep that in the back of your minds because we're gonna talk about that as we go on. These early harbor maps are, are, are quite telling. Uh, and, and the important feature, and, and this is an early French map from the mid 1700s. And, and this is where the Yarmouth Bar is. And you, you can see how they've drawn this, how the French map makers have drawn it. They've drawn it showing that it was sort of water covered, but it had some high points of land. This map here is the land grant map from 1790. The 1767 was when the first grants were made, but the map was updated. And Yarmouth Bar at that time is described as a stony beach. So basically this, area where the bar was, you know, water would cover it at high tide. And if there were storms and stuff like that from the north and northwest, well, these storms would wash right in across the bar. And you could actually sail boats through here. And 1821, uh, Dr. Farish uh, wrote a history of Yarmouth, Yarmouth 1821. As a matter of fact, we recently reprinted it. So if you don't have a copy, pick one up. Uh, but Dr. Farish in that, he talks about days when he was told that lumber used to be rafted from Clare down along the shore, and they would actually bring those great big rafts of lumber across where the Yarmouth Bar is today, floated up the harbor to Milton to where the sawmill was. So again, there wasn't really anything uh, uh, much there other than uh, a really low shingle beach made out of beach stones. This is another aerial shot from 1951 showing the, the new uh, breakwater with the old one. But the main point here I want you to see is between this line here and this line over here, basically all of this was all a result of man and hard work and lots of money to build that up. It was basically nothing there other than some like some high points of rock and stuff. But uh, Fish Point was a, a logical spot for the first settlers to start setting up shop. Uh, it was close to the channel 
Okay, so there was good anchorage there just off Fish Point. It was a nice flat beach, rocky beach. And so it was great for setting up fishing operations, especially uh, what they did in those days was they, they salted fish. Okay, so these were perfect for putting fish flakes out to, to salt their fish. The first boat built in Yarmouth County was built there in 1764. Fish Point was so important that uh, a road was, was uh, surveyed from uh, Milton running all the way out to Fish Point in 1772. And in 1772, there was also a store in a wharf at Fish Point. And in this old photograph here, you can see the store. It's still there. Store in the, in the next shot too. And you can see a bit of the wharf versus sea level because, uh, you know, <laughs> nowadays a lot of what we do as a historical society is try to protect Fish Point, try to protect that history that's there at Fish Point. And we're, we're having to deal with rising sea levels. But you can see this photograph or this postcard photograph, which is from about 1900, shows you that even back then, you know, Fish Point was never a really high piece of land. So uh, anyway, we, we continue on working there. Fish Point, uh, again, this, this presentation is not so much about the people, it's more about the actual construction of the bar. But uh, one guy that I, I like to mention is Enoch Stanwood. Uh, I mention Enoch because uh, to me, he's one of the most colorful characters in Yarmouth history. And, and that again is just a story uh, of its own. He had many exploits, but uh, in the War of 1812, he was a privateer, and he was actually the first Canadian privateer captain killed in the War of 1812. His descendants uh, went on. There was a number of them that uh, were quite prominent in our history, and two of them, uh, to, to me, being a, a lighthouse fanatic, of course, uh, are the fact that two, two of his grandsons, John Hiram Doan, was the chief lightkeeper at Cape Fershu for 30 years, from 1873 to 1904. And his, uh, his, his cousin, Joshua Doan, was the bug lighthouse keeper at the same time, for the same 30 years. And Joshua Doan lived at that spot where my grandparents eventually built their retirement home. So the, the, the two cousins, both light keepers, just both lived on Cape Fershu, not far from each other. And of course, Stanwood's Inn uh, was named after Enoch and, and the Stanwood family carried on that inn business from about 1840 to about 1940. And there's some old pictures of the old building that Many of us will remember, stood there for many, many years, uh, and, and that was Stanwood's Inn, very popular. Uh, the first threat that the Yarmouth Bar faced was, was not from, you know, the sea, but from man, from ourselves, because uh, guess what? Yarmouth Bar was made up of great big, nice, smooth, round beach stones. And man, those beach stones for the early settlers, they were great construction materials for building cellars, for, for even building bridges. But uh, as well, they, they were used as ballast in the bottom of ships. And often ships, when they were empty, in order to be stable in the water, they'd have to add ballast to, to the weight of the ship if it was empty. And often these ships leaving Yarmouth would be leaving empty because they'd be picking up cargoes in other ports and stuff. Well, all of this was, was really threatening the bar. And, and there were so many rocks being taken away that it was a noticeable effect that the ship owners in Yarmouth became aware of that the, the channel was getting narrower, there was more silt that was being washed into the harbor. And so this, this was a big problem. They, they knew that the harbor was at risk and it required some desperate action. And that desperate action, believe it or not, went so far to the provincial legislature. And in 
1832, the 30th of May, there was an act that was passed in the legislature enacted by the Lieutenant Governor, the Council and the Assembly, that it, it should be against the law to, per, to remove stones or ballast being taken away from the bar or beach, commonly called the fish point on the western side of the harbour. Any person that should take away stones or ballast from the beach and, will, and are convicted will forfeit and pay a sum not exceeding five pounds, nor less than three pounds for each offense. So, I mean, that's pretty desperate. Uh, and it shows the, the gravity of the situation for them to actually have gone to the legislature. And, and I mean, they, they don't pass acts just for nothing. So this was a pretty serious thing. And, and it was the first thing that was done to try to protect that area. Now, exactly when they started building up the bar, it's unclear. There's, there's just not enough history that remains there. Um, obviously, in 1832, they, they took this first step to actually make it uh, against the law to remove stones, but they actually may have been, been beginning to build up crib work because uh, in 1859, for sure, there was a uh, 200 pounds uh, sterling that was granted to build a 200 feet of crib work at the Stony Beach. So they were starting to see where we need to do something here because our harbor is, is at risk. We got to stop the, those seas and that debris from washing in across that bar. And so somewhere back in those early days, they started building uh, up the bar. Now, what you had, and, and going back to these old maps here again, what you had between the mainland where Fish Point is and the end of the Cape was you had some high points, which were basically rocks, which were higher than, than the other area. And, and that's what gave the eventual breakwater the shape it has. Okay, that curving shape. Because if you're gonna build crib work, you're gonna follow the highest points of the rock that you can follow, because that's, that's your support, that's your basis of your, of your foundation. And where I've got the red X was a high point of, of land, okay? And basically that's right at the end of, of, the, of where the wharves are. In, uh, in 1871, the local representatives, uh, merchants, and everybody else, they began to petition Ottawa to do something to fix the problem for sure. So when they started looking at this in 1871, the reports that they produced that year mentioned that there had been extensive works that had been done previously to protect the bar by building crib work. And, and they had had some pretty good success. This is the 1871 AF Church map of Yarmouth County. And right there, going right across Yarmouth Bar, he's got passage for boats at high water. So as far as 1871 goes, uh, you know, you could, again, sell, sell your little boats right across there. The, there was a wharf because uh, some of the records that I've looked at referred to the fact that a gentleman by the name of George Smith, and there's many Smiths that lived in at the Yarmouth Bar, but George Smith and, and his son Freeland Smith owned a wharf and, and buildings on Yarmouth Bar in 1867, the year of Confederation. And that eventually was the property that Amos Brannan and Sons bought up. So anyway, um, in, in 1871, we get this engineer from Ottawa that, that uh, comes down and uh, he's met by uh, our member of parliament, Mr. Killam, and a bunch of the other big shots. And they go out and they start checking out uh, what's got to be done. And the public works engineer, uh, when he put his report in, I, I found this fascinating, but when he put his report into Ottawa, he mentioned that there were two options for taking care of what needed to be done to protect 
Yarmouth Harbor. The first option he estimated was going to cost about $9,000. And it was going to involve putting in 2,800 feet of crib work. So again, if you remember the earlier map I showed where I had the two lines. So you had crib work and rocks in the first half over to where the wharves are, and then a wooden breakwater after that. But all of that work was, was all estimated cost 2,800 feet, or sorry, $9,000 for 2,800 feet, 22 feet wide. Now, uh, I just wanna go back here for a second. And, and so this, this option was to basically uh, follow uh, uh, the, the existing crib work, which I believe had been built over to this high point to give access to that high point where that wharf was, and then to go the rest of the way over to the Cape. So that was the $9,000 option. Since we're talking about 1867 and 1871. I just want to point out this picture here. I find these old photographs, some of these photographs are just fabulous because they tell so much of the history because before they built the Yarmouth Bar, you know, we know that uh, uh, Fish Point and Stanwood's Beach was, was a big area for, for them to come in and process fish. So where exactly were they doing that? Well, if we look at this photo here, this is after the bar has been built. This is some of the, the little shanties and cottages that the fishermen started to build. And, and these were mainly places that they would stay in the summer when they had the fishing going on. And then they'd go back to their homes. Many of these folks that worked from the bar were, were, were migrant workers. Eh? They come for the fishing seasons and that's it. So if we enlarge that photo a little bit, you can see here along the edge how they've actually got crib work walls along the edge here. And again, you can see how, how these cottages or shanties, whatever you want to call them, are basically built out of any material they could find. <laughs> so whatever spare doors, a, a lot of it was material from wrecks. But in the distance where this arrow is, we, we notice an odd looking larger building. So if we zoom in on that area, this is in back of, of uh, Stanwood's Beach. So where you see that uh, the big white bait freezer nowadays, see the row of buildings that used to be back there? These were the original fish plants that were, were down at Stanwood's Beach before Yarmouth Bar was built. Now, after the bar was built, these buildings, which were already getting quite old, they were torn down and that lumber was recycled and used by the people who were living at the bar to build their houses. So nothing was ever wasted. Now, option two, this is what I find was really interesting because the engineer went back and said, you know, there's a second way we could do this. It's gonna cost more money. It's gonna cost $54,000 as opposed to nine. But the, this second option would greatly improve the channel in Yarmouth Harbor because it would increase the flow of the current uh, in and out through the, the harbor and keep it from uh, building up debris. And that alternate breakwater would have gone from Fish Point across to the end of the East Cape, what we call the East Cape, where the lobster pound is today. Can you imagine if they had taken that option, how radically different Yarmouth Harbor would be today? Would have been quite different. We're, we're talking, uh, this was one of the first major public works projects undertaken by our new Canada. And so $54,000 was, was not in the budget. And plus that, they had this other work that had already been done on the other option, option one, and it was cheaper, it was $9,000. So they went ahead and they called for uh, tenders and the tenders came in, the lowest bid being won by W. Rufus Churchill. And it was for $11,300. He was really neat. He must've been neat because the government came back to him and said, hey, uh, you know, you're the lowest bidder, but we don't have the money. Would you still do the work for us? And, and he said, yeah, he said, I'll do the work for you. I'll complete the work. You could pay me $9,000 and 
and I'll charge the rest to you in the next year. How's that? And so he went ahead and, and he did that, all that work on that first breakwater, uh, 2,800 feet. But uh, you know what? The very next winter in 1874, uh, the first bad winter storm came through and busted a hole in it. And that hole, I believe, was over here on what we call the northeastern corner. And it's in an area that some of the documents refer to as being the site of the old guzzle. So there we have it. There were two options considered. Option one gave us the breakwater we know of today. Option two would have been quite a different scene had it gone through. This uh, building the bar led to continued settlement, of course. And uh, by 1911, we had 120 individuals, 25 families living down at the bar. This map was drawn by Archie Madden and uh, Archie drew it up in 1981. And again, you can see all these little uh, buildings and, and stuff. The, there's our road, the same road we follow today. And so it, it, uh, it really started to develop. And the next big thing that showed up, of course, was the Parker Aikens Company. Established the year the breakwater was built in 1874. But in 1880, uh, they expanded their operation down and, and built the, the large uh, uh, facility you see there in front of you. We still had some wharfs along Stanwood's Beach. And the other interesting thing, this is the same photograph, and I'm just zooming in on this area here, because this is that area that I was telling you about where they used to get these breaches in the breakwater, and they'd have to keep repairing them. And you can actually see here the end of a guzzle. And this is where I believe this old guzzle was. But this is how they basically built the bar. They built uh, crib work walls out of round logs, and they backfilled all of that with beach stone. All of this beach stone is all being hauled by ox carts from the beach further up to the north, okay? And so there, there's a lot of, a lot of labor went into that. Parker Aikens uh, was, was quite an outfit. And this is the uh, picture of, of the, uh, their, their facility at the Armand Bar. The lobster canning factory was in this part on the end. Uh, this building is still standing today. And you can see how many people would have been employed down there at the peak of the, the fishing season. And they were into everything. Uh, and, and these guys, um, it, it wasn't just shipping, but uh, they were into lumber in a big way. And you could see this photograph from their facility on Water Street, which is, of course, rudders. And you could see the piles of cut lumber here because they actually owned all kinds of wood lots and owned the Matagan sawmill. So Parker Aikens had quite the, quite the setup there. And this is an interesting photograph for me because it shows just how wide the Yarmouth Bar used to be. Because uh, these are all fish flakes, okay? So that, that's rows and rows and rows of, of fish that are drying out. And, uh, and that's on both sides of the road. So there's our road to the lighthouse. You can notice the gentleman over here and these boxes were used to store the salt fish because if it was at night, I mean, they'd have to put them in the boxes, right? They couldn't let these things get damp. If it started to drizzle, if it started to fog, they had to put these uh, salt fish in the boxes, okay? So, it, and, and they had to be turned. So there was a lot of uh, work that went into it. And because uh, uh, you had to uh, often cover these up, they had these specially built boxes that they would use to, to uh, take care of the sulfate. The other thing that building the Yarmouth Bar made practical was it made dredging practical in Yarmouth Harbor. And it's kind of a coincidence, but at the same time as the bar was built, of course, we started getting our first smaller steamships. We, we started getting a couple steam powered tugboats in Yarmouth Harbor. Uh, and, and you got these steam-powered dredges. So building the bar 
made dredging the harbor practical because without it, there was no sense dredging it. It was just more stuff going to be swept in there next storm, right? More debris. So you had the dredging that started and, and the dredging work in Yarmouth Harbor started in 1876 and it continued throughout the years. Every three years, they worked and worked and worked on improving the harbor. They'd uh, dredge that stuff up, put it in a barge, they'd tow it offshore, and then they'd, they'd dump that offshore. Storm challenges and damage. Okay, so 1874, uh, 1873, the, the, the breakwater is built. The very first winter, 1874, big hole knocked in it, okay? Between 1874 and, and 1883, the Department of uh, uh, Public Works reports that there had been extensive repairs done over the years. And in, in, in 1883, they had spent another $4,457.99. For a total since the beginning of 37,000. Now, remember what I said at the start? I said it was estimated to cost nine. Rufus was going to do it for 11,300. You know, this, this is 1873. 1883, nine year, 10 years later, we've now spent $37,000. So there, there was work that had to be done almost every year to, to repair that thing. And then finally, in 1899, there's a really nifty report, and, and it kind of goes back, and it talks about, you know, the previous uh, 25 years and the works that, that's been done to the Stanwoods Beach Protection Works. And one of the neat things that they come out and, and say in this report is, is they say, you know, Yarmouth is second to Halifax as far as importance in Nova Scotia. You know, they were quite clear. We were number two in, in the province. And, and so this is, this is why all this work was being done. And uh, they, they noted, and this is in 1899 when this report is written, that between 1888 and 1896, there was really no work that had been done. It was almost 10 years they didn't do much work at all, if any. Now we know, looking at the work that had been done previous, that obviously there must have been damage continually happening to the breakwater. How did they deal with that? I don't know. But one thing I suspect, and this is where, again, this old picture comes in showing this old guzzle. But one thing I suspect is, is this is, well, I, I don't suspect, I know this is one of their biggest problem areas. This is where the sea kept breaking through. And I suspect that for a while, because you had Parker Aikens going full steam, and there had to be a way to get back and forth. I suspect that they actually may have built a bridge temporarily crossing that old guzzle so that they could at least get back and forth to, to where the Parker Aikens punch was. So in 1896-97, they spent another $6,000. And one of the biggest things that they did was they built a G-R-O-Y-N-E. Now that was a new word for me. <laughs> I hadn't come across it before. I understand that it's pronounced groin. And, and what a groin is, is, and this is right from the dictionary, is a, I had to look it up, is a, a rigid hydraulic structure built perpendicularly from an ocean shore or a river bank interrupting water flow and limiting the movement of sediment. It's usually made out of wood, concrete, or stone. Well, in 1896-97, they built a new groin on the northeast corner. And it was 175 feet long by 25 feet wide and 11 feet high made out of uh, round logs for uh, a, a stone-filled crib work. And uh, it had the good success, the report in 1899 mentioned, because already on the northern side of that groin, they had a buildup of beach stone that was about 12 feet high. And so when you go out to Yarmouth Bar, and, and again, this picture's from 1951, and I, I got to tell you, 
it's scary when you look at a present day aerial photograph because all of this rock and all of this beach stone that's here is, is all going away. It's all going away. And those of us that live on Cape Verchu, <laughs> we wonder, you know, when is the day going to come that uh, some of that uh, armor stone is going to come down. But this, this point of beach that sticks out here is where that 1899 groin was built. And, and that resulting beach is, is a result of that work. And what that did, it, it protected this area here from being washed out like it had been through the years. From 1899 onwards, you know, you, you continually had work that had to be done uh, to, to rebuild the bar. Uh, the old breakwater, it's, it's, I, I love this photograph here. It's from around 1900. Uh, there's the breakwater, partially ice covered. Here's the groin that comes out that protected the hole where the boats went underneath the breakwater. And there's actually a guy walking a dog coming across here. So just being ice covered did not mean that people weren't going to cross the bar. It wasn't for the faint of heart, but they were pretty hardy souls. So we continually had storm uh, damage and challenges. 250 uh, years later, 250 years, that should be 150 years, uh, we're, we're, st we're still having problems. Uh, we got low lying line land, we've got rising sea levels. This is a, d a description of, of I could have many in here, but a description of one storm from the 1930s when uh, the, the winds and tides flooded Stanwoods Beach combined with the heavy snowfall, uh, knee deep water in, in a lot of the houses. People had to leave houses to go to other homes that were on higher ground. Uh, I, I guess you could look out your window and see stuff floating past. The rear of the buildings were entirely covered in ice and the northern end of the breakwater and, and roadway had been destroyed um, and you could you could not get across there. This little uh, montage of photographs here is, is kind of cool. Uh, again, I love the old breakwater. Look how flimsy looking that is. Anyhow, uh, here's the, the breakwater covered with ice. Uh, a, a young lady, uh, I think, uh, crossing over here. The road going down to the breakwater. Here's the wharf buildings. Uh, you can see in those days before the armor stone went up, they just had a, a, a wall made out of wood pilings driven in there. Those would constantly need to be replaced, okay? You can see the sea breaking over there. Again, in, the, in this photograph here, I, uh, they've got logs across the breakwater because I, I think they've temporarily closed it. This over here, this photograph here shows the ice covered breakwater and uh, the arrow, again, it's a little photograph, but that's the old schoolhouse that used to be on Cape for shoe. When they put that schoolhouse over there, uh, they, they built it and the people from Cape for shoe and Stanwood's Beach went together to the school board because the kids at Stanwood's Beach were having to walk to Overton to go to school. And so they, they went to the school board, the, the parents, and they said, hey, we want to build a new schoolhouse that our kids can go to that they don't have to walk so far. And we'll put it at the end of the Cape for Shoe. So they put it there. But can you imagine uh, you had to cross that breakwater to go to school? And in 1909, out of the 33 kids that were enrolled at the Markland School, 21 of them lived at, at Yarmouth Bar. And I spoke to a couple of, of uh, those kids, you know, uh, I had lucky enough to, to reach out to a couple of them and asked them, I said, you must have missed days and days. They said, we, we never missed any days. No, we would walk across that breakwater, it wasn't nothing. And I just think of, of how funny it is compared to nowadays when it seems like on the drop of a hat, uh, the, it'll cancel school. This, this schoolhouse over here also marks the location. And again, let's talk about the Yarmouth Bar and, and how uh, at times you couldn't get across there for a long, long time if you lived on the Cape because uh, of damage to the breakwater or just ice. In, 19, in 1943, on January the 8th, 
there was a plane crash over there by that school and it was a, a, a Hudson aircraft, patrol aircraft out of Yarmouth with five crew on board. And, and they crashed there just beside the school. School had got out about a half an hour before that. And uh, apparently it was a, a, a terrible thing and uh, uh, all five of the, the crew were killed. The breakwater was ice covered at the time. And I guess when they went over to, uh, the military came over to take care of the wreckage and everything else, they had to actually take barges from Yarmouth and, and take them over there where, where they could get into the land because you, you couldn't cross the breakwater. And there was another period recorded from the 15th of December, 1943 to the 18th of March, 1944, when the breakwater was covered in ice nine feet thick and it wasn't until the 18th of March and 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 this was all done by the local citizens at the time right you didn't have department of highways and all this stuff right and these guys got out there and one day and and with their axes and stuff and they chopped the ice off to let cars get through for the first time and my grandfather in his journal on March 21st says First signs of life on the Cape for the whole winter as regards cars and people. It was could be quite bad. Yarmouth Bar, again, I, I think it's it's important to, to keep it in perspective of just how important it is in our history. And it's an inspiring place. And uh, through the years, uh, it's inspired a number of artists. And, and even today in the summer times, it, it, it makes me very happy to see uh, folks down there on the side of the road painting scenes from the bar and stuff like that and and, and artwork continues to be produced. The other neat thing was uh, uh, that a lot of people don't know is Yarmouth Bar actually inspired a chocolate bar and this is the actual wrapper. This is a wrapper from the Yarmouth Bar and, and back in the days of uh, the early 1900s, you got your chocolate bars and they were in, in cardboard boxes, little cardboard boxes. That's how they used to sell them back then. And, and this is the wrapper that would have been on the box that held your Yarmouth bar. It was made by the Phillips Candy Company up in Hebron. The new breakwater was built uh, or completed in, in 1951. I know it was completed in 1951 because my Aunt Betty married my Uncle Andy, Andy Sweeney, Betty and Andy Sweeney, and they got married and on their honeymoon, they went across the old breakwater and when they came back, they went across the new one. So 1951, we had the new breakwater built. And, and this, uh, this led to increase uh, traffic, uh, commercial and tourists. Uh, repair work though still continues. Last summer they filled a hole down here that was underneath the breakwater that they tell me was big enough uh, that the Department of Highways guys told me it was big enough you could walk into it. So anyway it continues to work and, uh, and, and what happens in the future who knows. But what we do know is it really led to the expansion of the fishing fleet that calls Yarmouth Bar home. And uh, with the closure of other wharves, like for example, the one in Kelly's Cove, uh, they started trying to build up Yarmouth Bar and, and, and make it safe for fish fishing boats. And, and so they put it, started putting these wooden wave breaks in. And you can see here this old aerial photograph, the line of wooden wave breaks. And here they've, they've actually used an old scallop dragger. And they used a couple of those old scallop draggers. They'd sink them and use those as wave breaks. But finally, uh, they, they actually got around to actually building uh, what we presently have down there. Uh, the, the Yarmouth Bar Harbor Authority exists. And it is a fantastic little harbor. And uh, there we have it there. It's, it's the home to about 30, 35 fishing boats now. A significant contributor to the economic picture of, of Yarmouth County. And uh, again, it's, it's all because of all the, the work and efforts and, and, and stuff that's gone into it ever since the beginning. And it's, it's really 
affected the, the history in Yarmouth as we know it today.